should start recording. Okay, I'm going to turn it away to you. Yes, I did as well. Well, good morning. Hi there. How are you doing? Fantastic. Thank you so much for uh, meeting us here in the digital uh, frontier. <laughs> That's quite all right. Anytime. Absolutely. Well, um, yeah. So like Rochelle said, uh, my name is Jake Arnold. I'm an instructor of English here. I'm the, the one who emailed you last night. I appreciate you getting back to us and everything. And uh, and once again, just meeting here and, and gosh, seeing your awesome library behind you is, uh, is quite wonderful. Yeah, it's nice to have, isn't it? Yeah, it's a new it's a new thing. I finally got myself a library after wanting one for 40 years. So it's also That's my fantastic. Daughter. That's fantastic. Well, um, uh, shall we dive right in? Yeah, ready when you are. Okay, okay. So uh, just to build a groundwork, uh, and before we get to kind of the students' questions, um, we wanted to kind of ask, so what does it mean to you at this point after writing the essays after Dark Mountain, what does it mean to be an environmentalist or, or maybe a recovering uh, environmentalist? What does that mean to you at this point? Um, well, um, I wrote the first one of these essays eight years ago, uh, and I founded the Dark Mountain Project nearly 10 years ago now. So it's been quite a long journey. Um, and in, in some ways, that book has kind of traced that journey. It goes over quite a few years of writing. So um, I don't know that it means much to me now to be an environmentalist at all. I'm not sure personally that it's a very useful word anymore for all sorts of different reasons. Um, and I also think now that there's a difference between activism and action and that action is always good. Well, often good, depending on what it is, but <laughs> activism is, is, is rather different. So I think that, I don't know, I wonder if we're kind of moving into a post-environmentalist age, actually, where that's, that's a word that was used for a certain type of action, which um, is already kind of being superseded, and I don't know quite what will replace it. And so is that what you uh, essentially would refer to as the neo-environmentalist uh, in your book? Well, yeah, I mean, there is that. There's also... Um, there's also a new generation of people coming up now, um, which is quite interesting to me, um, who are framing the kind of work they're doing as activists in a very different way. I don't know if you've come across this movement called the Extinction Rebellion, um, which is kind of kicking off over here in Britain and Europe. Um, and that's very interesting to me, both because it's a direct action movement, um, but also because it's kind of almost, a, it's like a post-hope movement, if yes. you like. That's a movement of people who are saying, look, we can't stop climate change at this point. Uh, and we're already kind of halfway through a horrible ecological apocalypse as far as much of the rest of life is concerned. But there are still things we can do. Um, and that's a very different framing from the kind that I grew up with when I was younger, which was very much a, a sort of, you know, we have to do this now, otherwise bad things will happen. Right. It's like there's, a, you know, the, the acceptance now is that the, we're already in it. You know, it's not something that's going to happen in the future. It's already here. And, and those of us who are living in the, the sort of comfy parts of the world um, are kind of spared a lot of it, although not all of it. Um, but, you know, th there's a great devastation out there amongst a lot of a lot of life, human and otherwise. So, yeah, it's like there's the, there is the neo environmentalist save the world with technology thing, which has been around for a long time. But then, as I say, there's also a new generation of activists, which is looking like it's coming from a different place psychologically and politically, which is quite interesting. Absolutely. One of the books we were reviewing alongside yours um, a year and a half ago now uh, was Elizabeth Colbert's uh, The Sixth Extinction, and mm. she speaks a lot uh, to that end as well. Mm. Um, okay, so on to the student questions. And so we have uh, Sarah, Ramsha, and Madison's question. They started inside your essay, the title essay, Confessions of a Recovering Environmentalist, um, mm. and they used the quote uh, here from page 80, like all of us, I am a foot soldier of an empire. It is the empire of Homo sapiens, and it stretches from Tasmania to Baffin Island. Like all empires, it is built on expropriation and exploitation, and like all, it dresses these things in the language of morality and duty. Uh, and so what their question boiled down to was, what are ways that environmentalists or, or some of these new um, identities that you were just talking about, what are ways that they can become even more effective in promoting the well-being of the planet? And what personal actions can the individual start in daily life to help better the environment? Well, um, if I take a step back, I could say that really that essay in particular, but also most of the essays in that volume and, and really much of the work around Dark Mountain came from uh, me having spent a good deal of time imagining that 
the the kind of global ship could be turned around, if you like, um, and coming to the conclusion that it couldn't. Um, and so that essay starts from that question, what do we do now um, if we don't believe that this can be turned around? Um, and so that, for me, would be the difference between a kind of classical environmentalist model, which believes that things can be reformed, and, and where we are now. So in terms of what we could do now, uh, that seems to me to be the first thing to do is to accept that actually we have created an enormous economic machine which runs under its own steam which isn't really controlled by anybody nobody's actually capable of slowing it down um, and it is almost reliant upon well it is reliant upon economic growth which is in itself reliant upon the destruction of the natural world in order to keep going if the machine doesn't keep going lots of humans are in trouble if it does keep going much of the rest of life on earth is going to be destroyed and that's the situation we're in. And I think it's quite important to firstly, just to be honest about that and to say that nothing we have tried for the last 40 years has shown any signs at all of turning that around. Everything's got worse. All of the indicators have got worse over that time on, on a global level, despite all the promises and the good intentions. Uh, and then secondly, to say, you know, recognizing that there are still things that can be done that are useful in our personal lives and in, you know, achievable actions and in uh in the kind of work that extinction rebellion is doing and the kind of work that conservationists are doing and the kind of work that actually anybody could do when they plant a tree um but the, to me the first realization the first acceptance has to come from that idea that um you almost have to give up hope to see beyond it if you like so you move beyond the kind of hope that the machine can be reformed you accept that the, the, the you're living within this kind of ecocidal industrial machine and then you work out what what to do about that and one of the things that's difficult about this is that it's got to be a personal journey for everybody there isn't an answer I, I think that we are kind of conditioned to look to people and say well what shall we do then mm -hmm. and there are lots of things that can be done um, but they'll differ from person to person as well there's no big solution to this because it's not the world is not a big math puzzle that we have to work out the answer to we're in a, we're in a dilemma which actually there is no good way out of and so everybody has to yeah work out how best they can nurture what is still there and protect what is still there and prevent further destruction of it. And there'll be lots of different answers to that, depending on where you are and what skills you have. Well, and, and I love that answer. That's what I mentioned in the email is the honesty in the book and, and uh, the several times that you mentioned. I, I don't really have an answer for this specific issue that I'm bringing up. I, I really appreciate that level of honesty. And I think the students did as well. Um, so on to the next question. This is from Emma and Jacob. Uh, and this one stems around business as utility. And so uh, this comes from the same essay, the title essay, Confessions of a Recovering Environmentalist. Uh, but they went a little earlier, and it comes from this quote, Today's environmentalism is as much a victim of the contemporary cult of utility as every other aspect of our lives, from science to education. We are not environmentalists now because we have an emotional reaction to the wild world. In this country, most of us wouldn't even know where to find it. And so their question boiled down to um, the business aspect of things and more of a corporate scene. What possible ways could a corporation or businesses meet environmentalist standards without affecting the business model on a large scale or sacrificing environmental ideals? Um, well, the short answer is that they can't. But I'll, <laughs> I'll expand on that. Um, I mean, look, it's important to distinguish between all sorts of different types of businesses for a start. Um, you know, a small local business has far more control over what it can do, and it can do far less damage than most of the big guys. Um, the problem in terms of a business model is corporations, um, which in America, of course, are legally people and have the rights of people, just as they are over here in, in Europe as well. Um, the entire world for the last 40 years, the structure of the global economy has been built around the needs of multinational corporations. Governments have been reduced effectively, uh, at least until very recently, on either right or left as effectively handmaidens of corporations and mm. the purpose of government now and the purpose of the states um, that, that run the global economy is to further the interests of corporations which in itself furthers the interests of economic growth which means that we can all continue to buy stuff we don't need and then throw it in a big hole which will then seep down into the ocean and kill most of the wildlife in it um, <laughs> that's called that's called growth and progress um, so that's where we are uh, and the corporations are the primary instruments of the destruction of the natural world. And they have been for many hundreds of years. 
They have been since the great age of empires. The British Empire only came about because British corporations wanted to go off rampaging in India and the Caribbean and elsewhere. The whole thing starts with economics. So the business model is the problem to be tackled, actually. And if you had one thing you'd need to do in order to uh, protect the planet, it is to destroy the model of a profit-led corporation. Because the profit-led corporation, which can um, offset all of its environmental destruction against taxes, and which very often uh, requires governments to clean up after the mess that it's made, uh, and which most of the time is quite able to pour its poison into the atmosphere in the name of profit, is is the problem here. You know, it's, it's, the, it's those corporations which have allowed us to create climate change. It's those corporations which have allowed us to create hugely wasteful economic models. Of course, they've given us plenty of stuff we like, but that's the dilemma. This is what we were just discussing. There isn't an easy way out of this. If you take those corporations apart, the global economy collapses. But if you don't take those corporations apart, the global ecology collapses, followed by the global economy, which it's dependent upon. Um, but really, I think that, you know, the, the first thing to do intellectually is to delegitimize that business model. It is outrageous that we have huge corporations posing as legal people, stalking the world, making laws in their own interests, poisoning the atmosphere and the seas in order to produce things that most of us don't need. Um, and to create, in many cases, a fictional economic growth on paper, which is also impoverishing lots of people. I mean, this, you know, this might be a different conversation if everybody in the world was, was doing fantastically well out of this. But of course, it's not. Inequality is growing. There's huge poverty. That's getting worse all the time. There are divisions between and in and within nations as well. And that's this, this is caused by this, this economic model. So I'm afraid I don't think there is a way to do that. I think we need to delegitimize the notion of the, of the, of the corporation in that sense and the economic model that it's based on. Now, again, that then raises questions of what you'd replace it with. Mm. And um, most of the alternatives have proved even worse so far. But that doesn't mean that there aren't better ways to do things. Um, and I think just to end, because I've talked a lot, uh, much of the problem there is scale. You know, these things are so big and they can operate on a global scale now that it's almost impossible even for governments to challenge them. Certainly for, for voters, you can't really do much about this at all. You might be able to change the governing party, but you can't change the governing corporations of the country. So there's a lot to think about there. But uh, yeah, no, I think the business, the business model is very much part of the problem and not the solution. Okay, so um, if that's the case, one of the follow-up questions they had was, so why, if that, if that is the truth, do we keep seeing sustainability efforts inside the agendas of companies? Uh, and so, uh, you know, they, they mentioned a number of aviation companies, they mentioned a number of uh, larger corporations here in the States, uh, mind you, that have environmental sustainability efforts built into their business model. If it is utilitarian and things of that nature, and if it is this kind of catch-22 uh, that you were speaking of, it, is that still worthwhile to do? Uh, mostly not. I mean, it does depend. And I have to say, I've, I've met lots of people who work within these sustainability departments in corporations, and they're usually very good people who want to make the corporation more sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not that everyone's a fraud, but, you know, the, the sustainability initiatives were put in place to make the corporations look greener than they are usually. Um, some corporations will genuinely do some things which will improve their performance, and that's good, but they, it will never affect the bottom line. I mean, the aviation industry is a great example of this. It's the fastest growing contributor to climate change in the world. So if you want to make that sustainable, you have to close it down. Um, but of course, none of us would want that to happen either, because we all like traveling. We're all part of that. But, you know, you can tinker around the edges and you can make planes more efficient and you can do all of these things. And they're all good things to do. That's fine. But if your fundamental business is a disaster, there's only so much you can do. I mean, how much can you do to make the oil industry sustainable? You know, probably you could you know, change all the light bulbs, make them more efficient, but it would kind of be tinkering around the edges. So most of those sustainability initiatives are greenwashing. But even the ones that aren't tend to skirt around the fact that the growth led corporate economic model is the thing that's eating the planet. So moving on from the business model, um, I guess somewhat uh, to more uh, on the aspects of food, the other book that we paired uh, that is being taught in the Introduction to Composition course is one by um, an agricultural economics instructor named Jason Lusk. It's called Unnaturally Delicious. Mm -hmm. uh, the subtitle of the book is How Science, How Science and Technology Are Serving Up Superfoods to Save the World. And mm -hmm. so it's essentially, uh, well, it's the opposite uh, of uh, Confessions of a Recovering Environmentalist. And so uh, in some of our sections, we're having them uh, 
create these interview questions and then go out into their communities and begin to find answers uh, at least locally, as locally as they can for these. And so one of the sections that um, one of the groups in one of my courses looked at uh, came from dark ecology, where you say that um, some people will try to teach you that GM crops are a moral obligation if we want to feed the world, if we want to save the planet. Precisely the argument that were made the last time around. GM crops are an attempt to solve the problems caused by the last progress trap. They're also the next one. Then you mentioned things like vat-grown meat, which is a specific chapter in the uh, in the other book that we're using called Bovine in a Beaker. Uh, synthetic wheat, synthetic biology is a chapter in the other book, and um, so on and so forth. And so one of their questions that they had was, how valuable is organic growth of food, whether it's large or small scale, when compared to the outreaching ability of GMO food products, would you accept starvation in order to uphold ideals? Yes, I saw that. It was a great question, that. Um, there's a few problems with it, aren't there? Um, let's start off with the notion of ideals. Um, this is nothing to do with ideals. This is about the destruction of planet Earth, okay? So, uh, you probably saw, and I'm sure your students saw the report that came out just last week from WWF about wildlife destruction. Okay, so we've managed to destroy 60% of the world's wildlife since I was born. Um, it's not idealistic to stop that happening. It's necessary to stop that happening. And it's ethically and morally correct to stop that happening. So we can have a lot of arguments about how we can do it. And that's all good. Um, but it's nothing to do with ideals, this. It's actually, a, it's, it's like a triage. It's about preventing the mass death of life on Earth. Here's a fact. Um, extinction levels are currently between 100 and 1,000 times higher than they would normally be, uh, uh, and higher than they were before human civilization. If we were, in the next 50 years, to stop everything that was causing those extinction levels to rise and get back to the normal background level of extinction, it would take up to 5 million years for the natural world to recover from what we've done to it over the last few hundred. So that's where we are. So I don't think it's idealistic to want to stop that happening. Um, mm. In terms of GM crops, this is interesting to me. Another fact, um, firstly, the great majority of food eaten in the world at the moment is organic, and it always has been. Um, Non-organic food is a minority thing. 50% um, of the world's food at the moment is grown on 25% of the world's land, and it's grown by peasants and tribal people. And every study that's ever been done has demonstrated that small farming and peasant farming and traditional farming is more efficient in terms of productivity than large-scale farms. So this notion that as you balloon out and get bigger and get more technological, you can produce more, it's not actually true. In the short term, often you can produce more of a single crop um, very efficiently over a large scale, but you're also depleting the soil disastrously and poisoning the water courses. And you're also causing all sorts of problems with people who are now eating monocultural diets and the huge problems that are now coming from people eating just one strain of wheat across the West um, are becoming clear in our guts all the time. Um, but it's really important to understand that organic food is just normal. That's conventional. Language is interestingly used here. We, we, we represent organic food as a kind of novel, freaky thing that hippies have done for the last 30 years. And we present um, uh, pesticide-ridden crops as what we call conventional. And it's actually the other way around. The majority of food's always been organic. Um, in terms of distribution, some GM crops can solve that problem. They can, they're, they're very productive. And some of them can be grown in particular places where uh, other crops couldn't be grown. But it's also important to understand that there's enough food in the world to feed everybody already, according to the United Nations. And that the reason they're not getting it is distribution, which is an economic problem. And sometimes it's a problem of corruption or warfare or all sorts of things like that. But famines are very rarely caused by just a simple lack of food. They're caused by people not being able to get them. Um, so the question of whether these novel foods can save the world depends on what world you want to save. Um, if you want to live in a world where everybody's eating high tech, vat grown meat and GM crops and living in giant cities and playing with their smartphones all day, then maybe it's a great plan. I don't want to live in that world. That's just a personal <laughs> preference. Um, but even if I did, it's a world that assumes that we're going to be moving on with the kind of techno progressive model that we've had for the last 50 years and that the whole world is going to want to adopt it and that the planet can cope with it. And I don't think so. Um, I think the bigger questions are cultural and they're economic. What kind of size of farms do we want? What kind of communities do we want to live in? Um, what kind of society society do we want? How dependent do we want to be on these high tech, uh, in my view, quite scary science fiction futures? And that's in some ways a personal preference. You know, some people love the idea of vat grown meat. Um, I find it horrible. But there we are. 
But I think you do need to be very careful of this idea that GM crops are a kind of miracle crop that will, that will reach out there and feed the world. There isn't any evidence, actually, that they, they could possibly do that. It's really an economic and a cultural question. And the destruction of small farming and soil around the world is a much bigger problem mm. in terms of hunger and feeding people. OK, um, so the next one is it's shifting more towards technology, which I think is good because I think that's kind of where we uh, landed there about that personal preference. Is there a particular advancement in technology or maybe a way of thinking that developed or spread that was maybe the catalyst in your mind of this division, this nature, uh, re you know, reverence with nature versus technology? Mm, such an interesting question, that, isn't it? I think people have been debating it for a long time. Um, and the interesting thing is you can keep going back. You can go back all the way to the dawn of prehistory. So you could say, for example, well, the problem really started with neoliberalism in the 70s and the power of corporations. But then you have to say, no, we've got to go back further than that. We'll go back to the Industrial Revolution, um, which incidentally is where the Unabomber thinks we should go back to, of course. Theodore Kaczynski, who I quoted in my essay, disturbingly yes. thinks that that was the, the cause of humanity's problems. And that may be true. But of course, for hundreds of years before the Industrial Revolution, we'd already deforested much of the earth and caused huge problems to the soil. Uh, and that's, that's a result of agriculture. So you could say, we need to go back to the agricultural revolution because when people start planting seeds and they start managing animals and they start uh, controlling the landscape, that's when it really kicks off. Um, and I think there's a good deal of truth in that, actually. The development of agriculture is an interesting one. And obviously that's one of the stories I cover in the book as well. The, the, the progressive story we have, if you like, tells us that agriculture was something we developed because it was better. But increasingly, the archaeological evidence tells us that we're a lot worse off for a very long time uh, in terms of health and longevity and general um, uh, life ways, if you like, than, than we were beforehand. There's a, there's a crash in human well-being when we adopt agriculture. Um, the spread of disease, people get shorter and they live less time, they have to work harder. Um, and it's pretty clear that hunting and gathering is what we were made for. So you could go back to that. But then, of course, even the hunter-gatherers had killed off huge, huge swathes of wildlife right across the continent, including in North America and Australia and everywhere else where the people first arrived. Uh, and maybe that's to do with weapons technology. So maybe it's the creation of weapons and spears or maybe it's fire. Maybe it's fire. Here's an interesting thought. When we start to when we start to create and manage fire, we're able to cook our food when we cook our food. Our brain changes shape, literally, because the cooked meat is easier to digest. Our brains get very much bigger quite quickly over a short evolutionary period. And we probably start at that point being able to tell stories or think conceptually. So it could be fire. And this is quite an interesting conversation, but it doesn't really get us anywhere because unfortunately we can't, <laughs> can't do any of those things. So I think I, I just I mean, this is it. It's just it's almost an evolutionary progression. You know, we just push forward when we find a new technology. We use it. This is why it's impossible to stop it. We know, no one can ever stop something once it's been developed and it gets adopted around the world. So we're, we're kind of almost destined to keep rushing onwards until we hit something hard, which is so, what we may be doing. Will, <laughs> so is there, is there a realistic path in your mind that would have made a difference for civilization? So going back all the way through all of those inventions, all of those you know human innovations, if we want to call them that. I, I don't know if fire qualifies as that, but... Um, is there a different path that we could have taken? This was another question that they asked that would have either prolonged this, uh, you know, end that would have changed the path for civilization. Well, the thing to bear in mind is that lots of different paths were taken. So we're talking from a particular culture, kind of industrial culture, which really sprang out of Europe and North America. And that was one path that was taken. But, you know, there were other paths taken. There are still people living on the Andaman Islands at the moment, which is in the news, who have been practicing the same culture for 30,000 years. Um, there are people in New Guinea, where I've spent time in the past, who until really the mid 20th century were, were living in a culture that had been going for at least 10,000 years. Famously, the Australian Aboriginal people have, you know, really been going for 50, 60,000 years. The Bush people of the Kalahari practice the same culture, as far as we can tell archaeologically, for around 100,000 years until the 19th century. So all sorts of different paths were taken. Many, many paths were taken. But the problem is that uh, a powerful society that's armed with high technology and weapons uh, tends to wipe out anything else it finds, which is what we've done and what many other cultures in the past have done. So lots of different paths were taken, but the, path, the people who choose the path of high technology and power usually end up winning. Um, but then, of course, we've kind of turned our high technology and power onto the rest of the planet. 
So yeah. I don't know, really. I mean, there are lots and lots of paths were taken. Uh, some of them worked and some of them didn't. The one we're in is plainly causing, you know, a major planetary disaster at the moment. So I but I don't think it, it, it's, you know, humans are humans are really good at solving short term problems, but not long ones, not long term ones. So we don't really ever sit down and think, oh, we've gone the wrong way. We'll reverse it in a rational in a rational way and go in another direction. It never works like that. We just keep trying things until they don't work. And then we panic and try something else. Um, and sometimes we get out of the mess and sometimes we don't. So I think that we're kind of in that position again on a global scale. Well, one of the answers that uh, you speak about often throughout the book, throughout the manifesto uh, and your websites is, uh, and you've mentioned here now, is telling stories. This idea of telling stories, of uh, passing on truths to help solve some of these issues. Could you expand upon that and clarify maybe which stories you think that we should be passing on? Uh, and this question comes from uh, the essay, The Poet and the Machine, directly uh, uh, there towards the end about which little seeds, which little kernels of truth should be passed on um, to make the greatest amount of change that we possibly could in the time we have left. Mm. Well, I mean, again, this, this, is, this is a good exercise for everybody to do, to do. Think about what stories you think have been told that you grew up with that weren't true, and then think about which stories might be true instead. Um, and, and the whole Dark Mountain project starts off from this principle that everything is a story. This is a very old notion. Any Buddhist will tell you that. You know, everything is a story. Everything is a concept. So all cultures tell themselves stories about what the world is and who they are and how they relate to the world and each other. And those stories make sense at the time that they're told, and then later on they stop making sense. So. If there's a story for post-enlightenment Western industrial society, it's the story of the centrality of humanity to the earth, that we're the most important thing here, we're the central thing, we're the pinnacle of evolution. That gives us the right pretty much to manage and steward the earth. Um, we're separate from everything else, which we call nature, which in some way is beneath us. And again, we can either trash it as we like or we can protect it, but it's still basically under our control. And centrally, we believe in this notion of progress, which is the really big story, which is this idea that everything always gets better. It gets materially better. It gets ethically better. You know, the arc of the moral universe bends towards where he, we happen to want it to go at the moment. Um, and that isn't true. And what actually happens is that things continue to get better until they don't. And we're at a point now where they're not getting better. For example, each generation of people in, in Britain at the moment is getting poorer than the generation before it. Um, we've obviously got an ecological collapse on a wide scale. We've got growing inequality. Technology, actually, curiously enough, has stalled in lots of areas and not developed uh, in anything like the way that we thought it would. When I grew up, I thought we were all going to be living on Mars by now. So I'm quite disappointed. Um, <laughs> I was looking forward to that. I was looking forward to living on Mars or at least having holidays there. Um, but it's not going to happen. So the, the story of progress, the story of human centrality, all of this stuff, is it's important to challenge it. And the stories we need to tell, in my view, and as I say, it's something everyone can think about themselves, um, are, are actually very old ones. I, I think when I started Dark Mountain, I had this slightly arrogant notion that we needed to create new stories, but we don't really because they're all there. And most traditional cultures have told them for a long time. Um, the stories of, of, of our connection to the rest of the world and our part of being part of a web rather than sitting at the top of a peak, stories of humility in the face of the natural world, stories of uh, the importance of not taking more than you can, stories of community, stories of rootedness, stories of, of um, almost religious stories that see the world or, or the natural world at least as part of a sacred web that we're part of. All of these things that we basically threw in the dustbin so that we could be enlightened individuals. We need to probably take out and start dusting down again and saying, well, maybe we were telling these stories for thousands of years for a reason. Uh, and maybe you know, science and technology haven't actually rendered them all irrelevant. Perhaps it's time to start looking again at what we seem to have forgotten. But I would, as I say, I'd encourage everybody to start thinking, just think that way as a kind of life exercise. You know, what stories make sense to me now? If the stories my culture always told me don't work, which ones do um, in terms of my relationship to everything else that lives and not just people? It's a very interesting question. And people asking that question is how we're going to get to some interesting new places, I think, in the next few decades. Fantastic. Um, and so the last one on the list uh, uh, was um, was kind of what I was mentioning about what I, I appreciate about your book as a writing instructor, uh, mm -hmm. where in your introduction you say, uh, this is from page four, I was trying to work out what I thought about all of this and what to do next and how to stay sane um, mm -hmm. as I did so. Uh, 
And I think that that's a part of the writing process that gets left out uh, way too often is not really starting off with an end in mind, not really, you know, writing to figure out what you think instead of writing about what you think. Um, and so could you talk a little bit about the process that you went through, uh, you know, from from the eight rules to the manifesto to really sitting down and jumping into these essays uh, about the process that you went through in writing them and just constructing them as a writer and um, maybe shine a little light on that uh, that process yeah. that you went through for years. Yeah. Well, I think it's important, again, to understand that this this kind of came from a collapse of faith for me, you know, having been an activist for a long time and thinking I knew what to do and thinking I knew how things could be solved. And being as a younger man, somebody who did write a lot of those pieces about how, you know, that start off arguing from a position and trying to prove other people wrong right. and trying to make arguments for why you think you're right, which are the easiest pieces in the world to write. <laughs> and there are so many of them around at the moment. And I'm really, really fed up with them because everybody's just producing this stuff and then fighting about it on the internet and the environment is toxic. Uh, and if, if more people would just say, I don't actually know, I think we'd be in a much more interesting culture. And there are good writers who do that. But for me, it really started out from getting to this point where I thought I, none of that works and I don't know what I'm talking about. So I had to kind of make myself vulnerable and say, look, I'm just going to start writing to explore something rather than assuming that I'm going to get to a comfortable place at the end of it. Um, and that means you have to write much longer essays. Actually, it turns out, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is why some of these are so long. Um, because you can't explore what you think in 500 words. Um, but, True story. <laughs> yeah, but it's, um, you know, it's. I, I really think it's the difference between a kind of what I would see as an honest, interesting form of writing, whoever it's done by, and just polemical stuff that's written to prove points is exactly that. That starting off from a vulnerable place and not being afraid to be vulnerable. And I think actually all great writers uh, not that I'm putting myself in their company, but all great writers actually always start from a place of vulnerability of saying, I don't mind exposing myself to the world in a way. You know, I don't mind people knowing that I don't know what the answer is or that I don't necessarily know what I'm doing or that I'm just because that's actually just what it means to be human. And, you know, who some things we know and some things we don't. But on these big, big questions, there aren't any easy solutions. And so the question of what you can do, but more importantly, how you can kind of live through it. Uh, and, and for me, a lot of this, the background, the big background question for all so many of these essays is how do I live through knowing all this, knowing what's happening on a global level, knowing that I can't actually do much about it? You know, there are some things I can do, but I'm just one small person and I can't change the direction of travel. And that's a really hard question. And we all live with that. Um, and, you know, the, the answer ultimately is just you do what you can do. And, you know, you everyone has their own work, but it's just living. It's a very hard time to live in psychologically, I think. You know, the state of the world, the destruction of the world and the amount of sheer knowledge and information we have about it, you know, even compared to a couple of decades ago, is pretty much unprecedented. So it's a kind of giant assault on the senses. And I think you have to write or I have to write anyway from that, that as a starting point just like this is pretty overwhelming living through this and it's okay to say that and it's also okay not to know what to do and it's okay to be vulnerable about it and it's okay to change your mind you know and if you start from that position you can kind of breathe a big sigh of relief you know and then you can start digging into it as a series of questions rather than a kind of battle you have to win right i just i just i like that kind of writing and i'd like to see more of it because that's that's also what changes things you know we're in a giant mess and things will have to change and are starting to but they'll only change when people start really honestly asking these questions. And lots of people are doing that already and it's it's becoming more common. So, you know, that kind of, yeah, that vulnerability is the starting point, I think, for discovering surprising new things. And so just as a final uh, piece of advice for, you know, all of the students that we're learning alongside um, who are living with your book, what advice do you have for them uh, as they are working through your book, as they are living with it, as they are writing about it and reading these essays and the truths that you put down, the stories? Do you have any final pieces of advice for those students and the faculty uh, as well who are uh, who are working through this uh, through this collection uh, of essays? Well, I hesitate to give life advice to anyone because I might get sued or something, you know. <laughs> I'm sure it will be terrible, but <laughs> no, serious. Um, well, look. Um, Here's the thing. I would say a few things, probably. The first one is, you know, as as we said in the in in the early days of Dark Mountain, it's time to stop pretending, which means, you know, don't tell yourself anything that, you know, isn't true. Uh, 
just because you want it to be true. OK, there's a big difference between what you think is true and what you would like to be true. Uh, and, and the gap between those two things is where the interesting stuff happens. So don't lie to yourself about the world you're living in. Don't lie to yourself about what's possible. Um, don't lie to yourself about the enormous mess we're in. Um, but at the same time, don't think that that means there's nothing you can do, um, because actually we need people doing creative and radical and daring marginal things all the time. Here, here. Um, and here's the thing, right? In any society throughout history, as far as I can see, change always comes from the margins. It never comes from the center. OK, all the great religious figures, all the great founders of religions, all the interesting writers, all the inventors, all the scientists, or the great majority of them anyway, and the artists too, were doing their work on the margins of a society that didn't really understand them. And many of the people that we take for granted as great artists or writers or scientists or anyone today were regarded as ludicrous fools in their own time. So don't be afraid to be regarded as a ludicrous fool. It happens to me all the time. Uh, and maybe I understand one. Maybe I just, it just could, could be a good reason for that. But, uh, but you know what I mean? I mean, it's, don't, don't, the new ideas will come from entirely outside the system. They will not come from the center. They never do. So when you're, when you're in such a mess that we're in now, you don't expect the politicians or the corporations or anyone else to get us out of it. Of course not. They're invested in the system. They're still trying to make it work. So we need, we need new thinking. We need new approaches. And everybody can do something. You know, you take your, take your position up. Anyone can plant a tree. Anyone can protect something. Anyone can tell new stories. And that would be the final thing I would say is always question the stories. What is the story that you're telling yourself that got you or got your culture into the mess it's in? What did you believe that turned out not to be true? And if it's not true, what should you believe instead? And be really hard headed about that. And as I say, don't tell yourself something you want to hear. Uh, only tell yourself something you think is true and fumble your way through it. And also, finally, don't be afraid to be wrong. <laughs> do not be afraid to be wrong because it's only by being wrong lots of times that you might get towards being right absolutely so there's the, that's my that's my uh yeah shorthand life advice for everybody oh well <laughs> this, is, this has been absolutely brilliant i really appreciate the opportunity oh, to get to speak with you uh about your book it has been unbelievably compelling uh to uh to talk about it to write about it with, alongside students and uh and with the faculty and so thank you uh for for doing this thank you for writing the book for establishing dark mountain we really really appreciate you sir well, thank you. And thank you for reading it. And thank you for forcing all those poor students to read it as well. I, I'm sorry about that. But uh, no, it's great. It's really it's a, it's a great honor to have so many people on the other side of the world reading my words. And uh, yeah, it's really interesting to hear what they're making of it. So uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. Thank you. If you're ever in Texas, come come visit us. I will do. I'll take you up on it. Yes. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon, Mr. Kingsnorth. Okay. Take care.